Good evening. Thank you for joining us for another of our TeleArtworks online lectures. Before we begin, I should like to give you some information about the Atelier at Flowerfield, a 5013C not-for-profit organization. Our spring session starts on Monday, 325-24, and classes are open for registration on our website, the Atelier at Flowerfield.org. We offer a variety of art uh, in drawing and painting classes in a variety of mediums, both online and in studio. We also offer classes in illustration, anime, and digital painting. Our current exhibition is our third annual middle school and high school invitational juried show featuring artwork by students from all over Long Island. And we have our closing reception on Saturday from 12 till two, everyone is welcome. And the gallery is open from nine to five, Monday through Saturday. And that current show will actually end next Friday. Tonight, Atelier artist, instructor and neurologist, Dr. Fred Mendelssohn is presenting a lecture titled A Neurologist at the Easel, Effects of the Arts on the Brain. We welcome him this evening and hope you enjoy tonight's lecture. Um, if you wish to ask questions, please wait until the end and then we will open up um, a discussion. So I shall now hand over to Fred. Good evening and welcome. And thank you for attending this this evening. Um, the idea of this is to discuss the impact of the arts on the brain, not only on adult brains, but on developing brains uh, and how the, the and then it, how the impact of the arts can affect cognitive development in children, uh, and affect our emotional well-being. The uh, benefits of artistic expression can be very numerous, and hopefully we can touch on some of those this evening. Um, creating art or music can even stimulate parts of the brain's reward system, uh, releasing endorphins, and thereby producing feelings of joy, fulfillment, um, and even exposure to the arts has shown to increase our problem solving skills. A lot of uh, what I intend to discuss tonight uh, has been scientifically proven and there are many experiments that I could point you to. And I will not bore you with the details of some of those uh, experiments this evening. Um, if uh, you want to get further information about these in a concise way, uh, I could uh, send you to my book, A Doctor's Journey. Uh, in this book, I um, chapter 10 is devoted entirely to this topic, and it's quite a lengthy topic, uh, quite a lengthy chapter, but uh, it's enjoyable in some ways. Um, I guess I should start by explaining who I am and how I came to this interest in this topic. Um, I am a neurologist. Um, I was fortunate uh, to uh, be born to a very gifted musician. My father was a professional pianist. And uh, so at a very, very young age, uh, probably while I was still in my mother's womb, I was exposed to his music, uh, which was ongoing uh, every day. Uh, in fact, I eventually followed in his foot, uh, footpath and uh, became a music major. I uh, went to college on a music scholarship. I was also fortunate um, that at age 10, uh, we moved into a uh, we moved out of the city and out to Long Island and my, ne my next door neighbor was a professional artist. And so on Saturday mornings, I would go to his home uh, and he taught me how to draw. Um, not paint, but draw. I learned about perspective, um, line, value, etc. And I continued my interest in the arts and eventually started painting which I 
did all through medical school. Actually, there's one interesting story about uh, painting in medical school. Of course, I was in a, a small apartment house and uh, I was painting. After completing a picture, I wanted to uh, fix it with some uh, retouch varnish. And I sprayed it. And within 15 or 20 minutes, my apartment was inundated by every other uh, occupant of that apartment house, uh, wondering if I was trying to poison everyone with the uh, <laughs> the the smell of the uh, turpentine. That's when I learned that if I wanted to continue uh, painting, uh, I had to do it in a non-toxic way. And to this day, I still paint in a non-toxic way. And I actually teach that at the atelier. Um, Eventually, my uh, academic interest turned towards science, and I ended up in medical school and eventually became a neurologist. So that's, I guess, how I come to caring about how the arts affect the brain. Um, the, a lot of what I say, uh, what, I, about what I tell you this evening, uh, applies to the field of music. However, there is also ample uh, research done uh, in the art, uh, field of art, uh, and I will discuss those as well. Uh, but understand that the effects of the artistic expression, whether it's painting, sculpting, uh, dance, theater, uh, they, they are all, all um, part of this discussion. In fact, music and art have evolved over the decades uh, in a very similar fashion. And uh, what effects uh, one has on the brain, the other has on the brain as well. Um, as regards the uh, parallel evolution of music and art. Let me just say that uh, at about the time Monet and Renoir were experimenting with uh, light and how to how to paint light, uh, Debussy and Eric Satie and other musicians were also uh, working on impressionism. Uh, as it regards musical expression. And then as we get to a, a more recent time, if you look at uh, the evolution of jazz, um, there, has, there was a period started by, I guess, Miles Davis and Bill Evans, where they decided to deconstruct music. Um, prior to that, Western music had resolutions that were pleasant to the Western ear. Um, the music always resolved to the dominant. When Miles Davis uh, started his jazz, modal jazz, uh, there was some deconstruction of that. And uh, entire songs were built on one chord or two chords. For example, the most the most famous uh, one uh, is called "So What." Miles Davis has takes credit for that, but I understand Bill Evans actually wrote it. Uh, that entire song is based on E minor and D minor, two chords. There's no resolution to the uh, to the dominant, and that has become our way of listening to jazz, that actually e devolved further into hip hop where there is no real structure. Um, well, on or about this, that time, the, art, uh, the artists began to deconstruct their work. Um, when uh, Monet was painting, um, if he painted a hay bale, it looked like a hay bale. If he painted a house, it looked like a house. But when Jackson Pollock decided to paint, uh, it would no longer became important uh, to uh, show structure. 
So that just shows that the, the jazz and art are, uh, excuse me, music and art are so closely related in, in every way that everything I, I speak about tonight uh, it, it, it has to do with both fields. So what, um, what does studying music uh, or art, how does that affect ch young children? Well, certainly it helps fine motor skills. It helps with coordination, hand independence. Um, and if you're a drum student, you learn hand independence and foot independence. Um, when a child grips a pencil, chalk, crayons, if he molds or he or she molds clay, strums strings on a on an, a stringed instrument, beats a drum, plays a keyboard, they are developing fine motor skills. Learning art and music also helps with patterning. On a keyboard, there are white and black keys. Um, and children learn that if they play a certain pattern, for example, thirds, a pattern of thirds on the keyboard, it, that produces a certain sound. On the other hand, if they play fourths, it produces quite another sound. Um, Children also learn cause and effect. For example, if they press firmly on a crayon, they get a dark line. Vice versa, if they press gently on a crayon or pencil, it becomes a fine line. Similarly, if they pound on a keyboard, it's loud. And if they play it gently, it's soft. Children also learn mathematical skills. They learn concepts of shape and size, comparisons, big versus small. And this actually helps with spatial reasoning. And in many ways, it helps uh, with mathematics. How do sounds and colors affect us? <laughs> I was looking around my, my studio for something painted with Kelly green colors, and I can't find anything. It's just not my style of painting. But bear with me for a second. If you close your eyes and think Kelly green, that, that hot, bright green, if I suggest to you that maybe you would associate that color with a raucous parade down Fifth Avenue. I don't think that would be a stretch. On the other hand, if I showed you a painting with cool greens, this is a, a painting I did, plein air painting in Central Park. I don't know if it shows well on this, but those are cool greens. And I think that most of you would feel rather calm looking at that picture. For that reason, um, we know that warm colors affect us emotionally in a different way than cool colors. Um, red is a warm color, probably one of the warmest. Uh, we think passion, we think heat, we think uh, Valentine's Day, it's all red, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> you won't ever see the walls of a, a mental hospital painted with red. They will be cool colors because they're more calming. Um, this is a, a, a painting I did, uh, actually a photograph of a painting I did. Rushing waters, um, sharp edges on the rocks. Uh, it's sort of a chaotic pattern. I think this evokes a feeling of movement, excitement, energy. When I look at this, I feel unsettled. I can almost hear roaring water in the distance. As opposed to, this is another painting I did of orchids. 
this vertical pattern of these or, or, or orchids. I don't know, when I look at it, I feel calm. Uh, they're almost butterfly-like, butterfly -like, as if they're floating off the uh, top of the canvas. So a completely different emotion and a different feeling than looking at the rapids. Why is it that when we look at a certain image or we hear a certain sound, um, our hair stands on it, or we feel this tremendous emotional response? Well, science has proven that uh, there are changes in different neurotransmitters that are released in our bodies in response to certain sounds uh, or in response to seeing certain images. Some of these neurotransmitters create feelings of excitement and some are calming or actually feelings of depression. For example, if there's a large release of dopamine, uh, that would make us feel more excited, happy. On the other hand, a release of another neurotransmitter, GABA, which stands for GABA amino butyric acid. I promise that's the last thing I'll say about that. Uh, we might feel more depressed with GABA being released. So, for example, serotonin levels can be monitored in our saliva. And so they did a scientific experiment where they took half the group and had that group either look at beautiful paintings or actually paint beautiful paintings. The other group of people just sat quietly reading a calm book. After an hour, they checked serotonin levels in the saliva of all these patients. And the serotonin was higher in those that were exposed to beautiful art. Similarly, they checked cortisol levels in the blood. Cortisol is a hormone that's elevated during periods of stress. So again, they broke the group into two and half of the uh, participants looked at beautiful pictures or actually created beautiful artwork. And the other half quietly read. And 30 minutes, after just 30 minutes, the serum cortisol levels were lower, meaning less stress, in the individuals who were producing art or looking at art. Let me take you back in my life oh, about 75 or 76 years. At that time, I was a rambunctious two and a half, three year old. And I crawled up on my father's piano bench while he was playing. He stopped playing, looked at me and smiled and said, Fred, would you like me to play something for you? They apparently said yes. And he played Rimsky Korsakoff's Flight of the Bumblebee. If you're not familiar with this piece, it is a frantic, up tempo piece of uninterrupted runs of chromatic 16th notes. His fingers were flying all over the keyboard. That song affected me in such a way that I sat transfixed for the entire performance. I didn't say a word. I didn't move. Uh, my mother used to like to say that she thought I stopped breathing. Um, oddly, that is one of the very few memories I have of my childhood. And interestingly, that's the only memory I have of that room in that apartment where we live. I can still 
see my father's fingers on the keyboard. That's the power of the arts on our brain. To this day, I still feel feelings of elation and I get chills when I hear a good tenor sing Nessun Dorma from Turandot or a soprano sing Umbeldi from Madame Butterfly. While I love music, um, I will say that art, painting in particular, um, is more like Zen for me than music. Um, when I get into a painting, I am completely lost. The only thing I see is my painting. The only thing I think about is my painting. The world goes away. I must say that when I was performing music, uh, I often didn't feel completely gone like that. Uh, in fact, I'd be quite nervous. There is uh, nowadays something called creative flow. Creative flow. And that is that feeling where we are, we become totally relaxed deeply absorbed and the world disappears except for that that thing that we're doing that puts us there. In fact, they have done very, very specific electroencephalograms, EEG testing, on people that experience uh, creative flow. And the group they looked at were 50 5 -0. Um, jazz guitarists and they hooked them up to an EEG machine and let them take off on their guitars into uh, jazz improvisational uh, licks, we call them. Not every one of them reported that they were in that zone, in that creative flow zone while they were playing. But those that were, and those that did admit to that being in that zone, their EEGs showed less activity in the frontal lobes and more activity in their left temporal and their left uh, cortical hemisphere. Um, so their executive functions were suppressed while they were in this creative zone. I think that's fascinating. That's me. So let me talk a little bit about science. Um, what happens when we learn new things because of our musical or artistic uh, experience? There's a concept known as plasticity. And that simply means that the brain is able to form new synaptic connections and result in different skills. For example, if you are an individual that normally grips a toothbrush with your right hand, try putting your hand behind your back, your right hand behind your back, grip the toothbrush brush with your left hand and brush your teeth. I am certain that the vast majority of people who are listening tonight would say that they feel clumsy trying to brush their teeth with their left hand. Um, however, if you do it every day, after a very short period of time, you will be skilled at that. Why? Because your brain was able to form new synaptic connections. At this time, we don't think we can create new brain cells, but we can reconnect the ones we have. I'll give you another example. There's a famous neurologist and a very prolific author named Dr. Oliver Sacks. He's written some very entertaining medical books, if you're into that. <laughs> um, but I, and I believe this story that I'm going to tell you comes from his book, 
entitled The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Um, it's, it's a good book. But anyway, there's one section where he talks about a 70-year-old woman who suddenly lost her hearing. She was without hearing for a couple of years. Um, now, the, the, the brain doesn't like to be isolated like that. So she would entertain herself um, by listening to music in her head. Well, eventually, fortunately for her, she had a cochlear implant performed uh, when she was 73 and it restored her hearing. Her complaint to Dr. Sachs was she could not get this song out of her head. Because of plasticity, she formed a whole new set of neural pathways. And she heard this song in every waking minute. Um, she actually, that, there's a term for that, by the way. It's called an ear worm. Um, there's another fascinating experiment I'd like to share with you. It was performed by Dr. Lakova. Dr. Lakova looked at 50 people who were congenitally blind. Functional MRI studies on blind people, congenitally blind people, show no activity in the visual cortex, the occipital area of the brain. What she did though, was she had these blind individuals trace beautiful pictures that were made with raised images on them, intentionally raised images, like Braille. And um, every day for a number of months, the blind individuals would run their hands over these beautiful pictures. Then, after a few months of training, they performed functional MRI studies on these individuals. And while they were in the machine, they were asked to paint a picture. And lo and behold, their visual cortex showed evidence of activity on functional MRI studies. So these areas of the brain that were completely silent before were now showing activity. In 1793, it's an interesting name, Vincenzo Malacarne. If my Italian isn't too rusty, I believe that means bad meat, uh, Malacarne. He did an experiment. Now, the, the details of this experiment are sketchy because it was a long time ago. Um, but he, quote, paired animals that were likes, like animals. And he trained half of them. I don't know how he trained them, what he trained them in. But the story goes that he dissected them after a number of months. Actually, I think it was a year. And he discovered that their cerebellar hemispheres, cerebellum is part of the brain, in the back of the brain, the undersurface. Their cerebellar hemispheres were larger in the group that were trained than in the group that were not trained. Uh, 200 years later, Dr. Rao Shea and others in the journal Nature studied the effect of listening, excuse me, of children listening to the music of Mozart, what the effect on their spatial reasoning was. And this, those students that were uh, exposed to the music of Mozart at a young age actually scored higher on tests of intelligence. And his uh, theory was that music stimulated parts of the brain associated with spatiotemporal reasoning, thus increasing their aptitude for math and sciences and improving intuitive thinking and problem solving skills. This had become known famously as the Mozart effect. 
And there were studies that I'll, I'll mention quickly after this, but let me just read a quick quote from Dr. Albert Einstein. In 1929, in an interview of the Saturday Evening Post, Professor Einstein was asked how he came about his theory of relativity. And he stated, quote, it occurred to me by intuition and music was the driving force behind that intuition. My discovery was the result of musical perception. In 1996, there was a study from the University of California looking at three-year-old three -year children. Half of the group, half of their study group studied piano and the other half of the three-year-olds had no particular music exposure, no particular music exposure. After eight months, the group that learned piano or were taught piano, I should say, scored 80% higher in tests of spatial intelligence than the non-musical uh, group. In 2001, uh, there were a group of studies presented at the American Academy of Neurology annual meeting, uh, looking at the effects of music on the brain. They pre presented evidence of significant differences in the gray matter distribution, distribution between professional musicians and those who never studied music. There was more gray, in, uh, more gray matter in the areas associated with complex problem solving and adaption to accommodation and new data. But now this is 208 years after Mr. Malacarne uh, discovered this, but these doctors in 2001 found that there were pronounced differences in the cerebellum size with musicians having larger cerebellum than non-musicians. Um, lastly, in 2007, there was another study from Northwestern University uh, where they found that musicians outperformed non-musicians on language, visuospatial, and math skills. So lastly, in closing, let me read one more quote from Professor Einstein. Also in 1929, in the same interview, he stated, if I were not a physicist, I would probably be a musician. I often think in music. I see my life in terms of music. I get my most joy in life out of music. And that's all I have to say to you this evening about that. If there are any questions, we'll be happy to field them. Um, yeah, oh. we're going to let people unmute to ask questions. So, um, Alex, if you would allow people to unmute their, their microphones, then hopefully we can get a discussion going. Have there been any studies? I, I have a question. We were talking about the effects of music on the cerebellum and that the um, musicians tended to have a larger cere cerebellum. Has there been any studies like that in terms of painting? I mean, does that have a similar effect or is it primarily music? Yeah, no, basically, I, in, I believe, I don't think there's any specific study to that. Mm. But all the, all the other um, studies I've looked at uh, really apply to both fields. So mm. that's what I tried to say in the beginning, that uh, the, what I was saying about music, I felt also uh, similar responses would, would occur with, with the studies we looked at uh, having to do with artistic expression or looking at uh, pieces of art. Right. Certainly, as, as far as the emotive uh, field, um, there's certainly a similarity. Dr. Mendelson, have there been studies? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, have there been studies on the locked-in syndrome and and art and music? Uh, yes. Um, and they're really uh, 
nothing has come out of it of much usefulness, to tell you the truth. Um, we all, um, all of us that believe in this um, effect will, I mean, I, <laughs> when we treat patients, many of us who feel the way we do about the effects of music and the arts on the brain will almost require them to play music uh, in the room of a, a patient who's locked in. Um, we, we think it has a great effect, but I, I don't know how it, we can prove that yet. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, uh, while they have, there are, they may be, I'm not aware of them, but I am relatively certain that if they were able to do functional MRI studies on a locked in patient, uh, and show them pieces of artwork or play different music, that there would be activity in certain parts of the brain. Remember with locked in, uh, patients, uh, we, we believe in most of them, almost all of them have uh, normal cognition or fairly normal cognition. And it's the, the, the posterior part of the brain that's been so damaged that they can't communicate or move. One other question, um, in the operating room, what kind of music did you play? Uh, almost always classical. Okay. Yeah, although I will say that <clears throat> when I was in Louisville, uh, as, as a medical student, um, the the operating room, the, the, there was one surgeon in particular that would listen to the University of Louisville basketball game in the middle of the operation. Um, I don't understand why, but you have to understand that in Louisville, uh, if you don't like college basketball, you really probably have nobody to talk to on a social level. I mean, that's, they live for University of Louisville basketball. I see. And have, have you ever interviewed a patient after the surgery and asked them if they remember any of that? Um, yes, and they do. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Huh. Yeah, one, one comment I had it. Um, so my mother suffered from dementia. She was a singer and a pianist. And it's interesting that the one thing she never really lost was the ability to play. She She couldn't play major pieces, but have they, I mean, why would that be? Why is it that you still can retain things? I mean, she couldn't sing anymore, but she could certainly play the piano, not extensively, but it, yes. she never really lost that. Well, you know, with, with dementia, um, most of us retain a long-term memory. It's the mm. short-term memory that's the, the problem. Um, I mean, individuals who are suffering from dementia have it it's impossible for them to learn a new piece. They can't memorize a new piece of music, mm. but music that they learned years ago, um, if they were very familiar with that piece, they will continue to remember it. Right, right. Yeah. yeah interesting. Hmm. It also seems that they, they also respond to artwork too. I mean, I, I'm thinking the same thing with my mother. I mean, she wasn't an artist, but my sister got her drawing funny little drawings, but it, it really seemed to um, soothe those times when she had the the sundowning and things like that. It, it's it's amazing what an effect it has on people, I think. Oh, absolutely. Um, one, of, one of the things uh, I did, what my avocation was, uh, I was very intimately involved in a school for uh, special needs children called Alternatives for Children. Mm. It was actually one of the founders of that uh, institution. And one of the things we had at that, uh, at our main uh, setting in Setauket was this, what we call the sensory garden. And, uh, you know, a lot of the children have um, behavior disorders as well as you know, other issues. And so when they go into the sensory garden, which was a room of very soft lights, uh, beautiful colors, uh, soft music, uh, shifting patterns, moving uh, 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 draperies that would look flow in the breeze. They were manageable. Uh, so I think the children not only it helped them learn uh, when they were having learning disabilities, but it also helped their behavior. So the sensory garden, we call it. Again, as I said, uh, there's... Uh, 
we know of uh, uh, scientific studies that prove uh, that there are changes in our bodies in response to looking at beautiful art or hearing certain musical sounds. Um, and these, there are definitely measurable changes in our chemical makeup. And what about the reaction to you would you touch and of course obviously talking about jazz and um, modern art as opposed to classical music, the more soothing classical music and traditional art, representational art. I mean, what are the do you find a significant difference in the way people react to both? Well, I didn't see any articles when I researched it recently uh, concerning uh, different forms of art on the actual brain but there are certainly uh when during the mozart effect science mm. uh the the response to mozart's music classical music was uh, much uh more marked than um if they listened to rock music mm. yeah they didn't mention jazz in that article but they did mention rock rock music what i mean what was the difference uh, they scored the, those children who were exposed to Mozart music mm. uh, scored higher on those tests, those intelligence tests that they looked at. Huh. It was funny after it, I explained that to my son when he was in college, he made it a point to listen to Mozart whenever he was studying for exams. He had Mozart <laughs> playing in the background. I said, just Mozart? He said, just Mozart. Mozart, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> So do you think with art, it's more to do with the color? I think it's more than color. I think it's patterns also. Um, mm. I think certain patterns are more soothing than other patterns. Um, mm. Yeah. I, certain certain colors certainly are, activate more of our stimulation, the stimulated mm. part of the brain. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Dr. Mendelssohn, do you think that different mediums also affect how you feel? You know, watercolors versus um, oils versus uh, acrylics? No, I, I think uh, it's probably universal. Um, but I, I will say that you probably would get different responses if you were involved in sculpting, uh, you know, spinning the wheel and running your hands on the on the clay I've never done it, but I I can think that that would have a different sensation uh, and register different things in the brain than painting a picture or drawing something. So I don't know. It would be an interesting experiment, though. Mm, that is interesting. Yeah. Mm. Uh, does anyone else have a question? No? <laughs> It was a very interesting discussion. I mean, I imagine you could go on for hours talking about the effects of different aspects of the arts have on people. I yeah, I tried to uh, consolidate it so it would be not boring. No. I hope it wasn't. No, not boring no. at all. Okay. <laughs> very interesting. Um, okay, if nobody else has any questions, um, then I guess we'll wrap it up. Um, I'd like listening. to thank you very much for a, a very much. fascinating. Yes, it was a wonderful talk. Very interesting. Um, I'm sure you could go on for a long time about it. Um, so thank you very much. I hope everyone else found it very interesting and engaging. Um, and just to give you a little brief update on Atelier goings on, uh, our next, le next lecture will be on April 24th, and that's being given by Randall Di Giuseppe, who's another instructor at the Atelier. And he'll be talking about the artist Jan Vermeer. Um, our next exhibition um, is coming up fairly soon, and that will be a solo show by artist Mary Ahern titled Not Just Another Pretty Flower. Um, and the opening reception for that will be April 18th from 5.30 to 7.30, and that show will run until May 30th. We also have another workshop coming up on April 20th and 21st, given by watercolorist Dennis Ponso. So please look out for our emails about lectures, exhibitions, and other upcoming events and classes. And again, thank you very much, Fred, and uh, good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.